Dean, we collaborated four or five years ago on one of the first big data dump stories, the, right. the US Embassy cables. Yeah. And since then, it feels like there's been a profusion yeah. of stories based on these huge leaks of data, yeah. whether it's drug, uh, athletes' drug data yeah. or tax affairs or latterly. Or uh, Sony hacks into the insides of Sony. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I just wonder whether you think it matters who obtained the material and why they obtained it, or whether it's just down to whether there are great stories in this information. Boy, that's a good question, because things really have evolved since WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks to me was a clear public service, right? And not, not everything since then has been. I don't think it matters where they come from, to be perfectly frank. I, I think you have to be transparent. As a journalist, you have to be transparent about where they come from. But I think the, the news value trumps all. I mean, if I, if I get a, a leak that really offers tremendous insight into how government or big business works and it's something important that people should know, I think that even if, it, even, if the, even if the source of it makes me uncomfortable, I think I still have to do it. I think I have to explain to people that the source makes me uncomfortable. But I put that in the category of, of there are things that journalists should should not withhold. There are things mm. that we, I don't like to know things that the readers don't know. Mm. But the and, world has changed. And as we've seen countries, the Soviet Union, China, North Korea, yeah. increasingly weaponizing yeah. hacking, yeah. it doesn't make you feel queasy that you're becoming a, a useful idiot in their totally. particular campaigns? To it, totally queasy. It does. Um, it makes me feel, I mean, WikiLeaks now feels like some sort of halcyon, um, idealistic, Era where early WikiLeaks, was, uh, yeah, early WikiLeaks, um, the, the the dump data dumps from mm -hmm. the State Department seems so, and the Defense Department, it seemed like such a powerful and important mission driven data dump. Mm -hmm. Right, it was about how governments operate. It it inspired parts of the Arab Spring. It was so clearly journalistically newsworthy, mm -hmm. and I think that the source was idealistic. Mm -hmm. I also think, by the way, that Edward Snowden was idealistic. Um, but you're right, we're now in an era when governments are weaponizing hacking, we're seeing it with the Russians, etc. But I still think, even though it makes me queasy, I still think um, it may be that the source is also part of the story, but I still think that if somebody gives us information that's really important and vital for people to know, we got to figure out a way to publish it. But how do you treat it differently? if the US government has formally said they are convinced that the Russians have, say, hacked the DNC servers to interfere in a US election, compared to if that information had been given to you yeah. by, say, a Manning figure? You do treat it differently. Um, you do make it clear, very clear in, in the story, in the presentation of the story. And you actually make, in the case of, of Manning, I don't think we would have investigated you know, Manning himself. Mm. Um, in the case of the, the, the hacks, the Russian hacks, you would investigate the source. You would ask hard questions about the source, but you still got to publish the stuff. By the way, not everything that comes through, one, one thing I think we have to be careful about is not everything that's leaked is journalistically worth publishing, right? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, can, I mean, I can use many examples where people give you, done, the Sony hacks are classic. Um, I don't think it's worth digging through there and finding out that some low-level executive mm. told another low-level executive something, you know, trivial, trivial but embarrassing. But it didn't keep you up at night worrying that you were doing the bidding of Vladimir Putin or Kim Jong-il? Sure it does. Sure it does. But it would keep me up at night worse, um, or at least longer, <laughs> if I had information from a hack that I knew was accurate. Mm that voters and citizens needed to know. Mm -hmm. um, it, that would make me really uncomfortable too. But, but let's, let's, make, let's create an example. <clears throat> let's say the Russians hack and give us, and, and somehow through some third party, we get hold of documents that describe a deep debate within the Obama administration about how to intervene in Syria. Mm -hmm. And it's really important and it's really a revealing. Let's even say that Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State then. Let's say we learn a lot about how the U.S. makes decisions. Let's say we even learn um, that they almost intervene more aggressively and pull back. And let's say they even pull back for political reasons. Mm -hmm. Let's say all that came through in a hack. 
Am I really not going to report that because I'm nervous about the source? No. I'm going to explain the source. I'm going to let readers know that, um, that, that the source of this doesn't make me comfortable. But how could I hold that information back? And will I lose a little sleep because I'm being manipulated? Yeah. yeah. But I'll lose a lot more sleep if I sit that stuff in a safe. But you've deliberately set, the b set that example at quite a high level of public I did. No, no, right? I did. I what, did. what if it was <laughs> revealing that President Obama had said he'd successfully given up cigarettes, but he hadn't? Oh, he that, yeah. Up. That's trivial. I'm not going to. I think, I mean, I, I, I missed the point. Um, of course you have to balance the import of the leaks. Mm -hmm. And even with the source of the leaks. Um, but if it's important, by the way, if WikiLeaks said President Obama you know, had some obscure, I mean, we ignored a lot of stuff in the original WikiLeaks stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, we ignored a lot of stuff that we either thought was trivial or would get somebody hurt. So you, you don't suspend your news judgment, mm -hmm. right? I wonder if we apply different standards to uh, electronic material that we would to, as it were, real-world property. So I want to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've been publishing recently uh, several of these stories based on the Podesta emails. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some people think that's another Russian operation. Mm -hmm. um, if someone had brought you a carton of papers, actual hard paper papers, and you knew for certain those were burgled from mm -hmm. John Podesta's home, mm -hmm. maybe burgled, maybe you knew they were burgled by a foreign government. Would you treat those the same as you treat a cache of emails? Boy, that's a good and very hard question that I've not had to confront yet. Um, so let me take a stab at it, acknowledging that it's in the realm of theory, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, would, I would go through it. And if it was really significant and important, I would publish it. Um, and, I'm, and I'm putting a lot of emphasis on significant and important, but I would publish it. It would make me nervous. I would, ex I would admit to people how we got it. I would be very transparent how we got it. Um, by the way, a few weeks ago we published a story based on, on Donald Trump's tax returns that somebody sent to us. I mean, I don't know who sent it. I don't know whether it was whether they were legally obtained. Mm. I have no idea where they came from. Mm. I don't have no idea whether it was from a disgruntled business partner or whatever. <clears throat> but the judgment was, my judgment was, this was really important. And the importance of it trumped the source. Mm. And I think in the case of the Podesta emails, I would make the same judgment. But do you think you would assess stolen physical material at the same level as you assess the kind of hacked material that is now becoming a, a commonplace? I, I, boy, maybe I'm maybe I'm idealistic, and I get and I get the difficulty. But I think the information trumps all. Mm. I think the value of the information trumps all, mm. and I think you have to be transparent. But I think whether it's text, whether it's documents, whether it's emails, whether it's, you know, John Podesta's theoretical calendar that mm. shows meetings that are newsworthy. I think the information trumps all. Mm. I think you just have to be really transparent and let mm. people know that you're holding your nose and publishing it. But God, I just think the information wins. So the thing we haven't talked about at all here is privacy yeah. and, and how you weigh that. Naomi Klein, I think, recently has said that she thinks that we're all getting it wrong now. The test mm -hmm. emails is the example I think uh, she particularly refers to. I just wonder how you think about the balance between an individual's right to the expectation of yeah. privacy, often about some of their most personal yeah. affairs, and the public interest in uh, publishing yeah. a story. I think the same standard. That the same standard that applies in everything we do applies to hacked emails, stolen documents, everything. If somebody dumps on me, and I'll leave John Podesta out, if somebody dumps on me a bunch of emails that show that a public official is having an affair, I don't think that's a story. I just don't, unless the public official is having an affair with a lobbyist. Um, I don't think I'm, I, I'm, you don't suspend your standards just because it's got to be important, it's got to be significant, it's got to trump the source. I still think that that's going to be the case. 
I don't think, and boy, I, I guard my privacy too, and I do not want people rummaging through my emails um, in the, in, in, to reveal how I run a 1,300 person newsroom. All that said, if I get the emails of a very powerful person, John Podesta is a very powerful person, arguably one of the handful of the most powerful people in Washington, mm -hmm. um, in which he weighs in on important matters of state and politics, I, I can't not publish that. I wonder if you think there's a paradox here that some of the early leakers, like Snowden, were kind of obsessed with privacy. That's why they were doing what they were doing. Yeah. And yet what we're seeing uh, in the direction that, that, that leaking and hacking has gone is almost the destruction of that privacy they yeah. guarded so preciously. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I too am nervous about um, the erosion of privacy. I too, I mean, I, 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 and our lawyers tell us, don't put anything in email that we don't want to be made public. That, of course, is actually impossible, right? I can't run a 1,300-person newsroom without putting stuff in email. Do you think harder than you <clears throat> would have done in the past about yes. what you put in email? Yes, and there are people inside, inside my newsroom who will not, I mean, I, every once in a while I'll send a nasty note to the publisher asking him a question about something and he just won't respond because he <laughs> figures it's going to come out one day. I get, I get that. I really get that. And I get the erosion of privacy. But I sit, as a journalist, I sit in a different seat. Um, these are all really hard questions and they get harder and harder and harder and harder every year. But I sit in a different seat. The seat I sit in is my job is to get information to the public. Important information, not trivial information. And that important information is worth, that, that same standard applies to whether it's from a battlefield or whether it's from John Podesta's email. And I'm always balancing the source, right? I'm balancing the source when an enemy of the, of, the, of the United States or of Great Britain lets us follow them, or whether the North Vietnamese lets a reporter in to watch them go on raids during the Vietnam War. You always have to tell people I'm doing something really uncomfortable. The difference is that in the past, we generally knew something about the source, and often right. we worked quite hard, didn't we, to understand yes, that's right. the motivations and then to reveal those to the that's right. readership or the, or the audience. And now, increasingly, we just don't have that information. Yeah. We, we, we're getting presented with information where often we can't, yeah. we can't tell how, yeah. how it came to us. But think of the alternative, right? And again, I keep putting the emphasis on important and significant information, but think of the alternative. I find out something really important about a, a member of the government and I don't publish it, I don't tell the readers because I don't know the source, but I know it's true because I've gone to the, to the subject and he or she has confirmed it, all of which you have to do. Mm. What's more uncomfortable? Am I going to bed at night knowing that the Secretary of Defense made a bad decision that got people hurt? and I'm not publishing it because maybe it came from the Russians. I can't imagine a slippery slope than that, right? At, at what point am I, is my safe at home filled with information I can't report because I'm nervous about the source? Do you come under any pressure from the US government, from any of the security agencies over publication of stuff that they think, for instance, the Russians have deliberately put no. away? No, I think uh, something happened after Snowden. I mean, I think uh, something dramatic happened after Snowden, which was before Snowden, I think the government stingily guarded every secret and they thought er nothing could come out. Mm. After Snowden, so much stuff came out. It was like everything came out. Uh, they s mostly stopped asking and I think they now know we sit in a different position. They mm. now know that my, when I say mine, I suspect it's true of every executive editor in the country, that my leaning is toward publishing. My, my question now is, tell me why I should not publish and give me a really good reason, otherwise I'm gonna publish. And that's changed since Snowden, do you think? I think that changed since Snowden. I think, I, think, I think Snowden, they used to argue over trivial stuff. Please don't report this because it'll, you know, it'll jeopardize our relationship with the country. I think Snowden threw all that out the window. So much of their stuff got published after Snowden that I don't think they, they don't even ask the question that's that fascinating. way anymore. One last thought. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, we, we 
both collaborated with WikiLeaks and, and Julian Assange years ago as partners, not yeah. just as sort yeah. of recipients of, of yeah. information. How do you feel about them, WikiLeaks and Assange now? Would you partner with them again? <laughs> you know, in the original partnership, I thought, I thought the information was so important. Um, but I always thought Julian Assange was sort of an odd duck, to be perfectly frank. And I think WikiLeaks has gone to an extreme that is, was at least unexpected to me. I think, I, think, I think Assange is actually trying to influence elections and is trying to be a player in a way he wasn't before. But still, if Julian Assange came to me and he had information I thought was really vital for people to know, I would um, take a deep breath and yeah, of course I would. 